thank you very much. Uh, uh, about two years ago in October that uh, our teacher, Raz Muhammad Zare, passed away. And it was some months prior to that that he was here. And some of you probably had a chance to see him speak. I had introduced him as the living coelacanth of spirituality. Coelacanth, you may know, is a fish that was thought to be extinct. And he has such a presence and was such an unusual person that I was delighted that he had agreed to come and be here. Uh, some of his students are sitting in the room here tonight with us, and this talk is dedicated to him and his memory. Um, yes, the common heritage of Sufism, Buddhism, and Taoism um, might seem like an improbable proposition to some of you on the face of it. Uh, those traditions are so different from one another across time and imagery and doctrine. But um, one of the earliest uh, Muslim philosophers, Al-Farabi, later known as Al-Farabias, in the Western world and studied by the Latin scholars, he said that all religions and traditions are at their source one, but they differ according to the imagination. And he meant by that not only the human imagination of the person and the culture receiving that new tradition, but also the divine imagination. So according to those people, there is uh, an imagination that uh, the world of spirit has and that the world of form is in fact, the manifestation. So just an example of that from the Islamic tradition would be that um, we know that the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, uh, had a, an ascension on a, on a very interesting animal called the Burak. And he ascended into the heavens and experienced different kinds of revelatory um, stages and different levels and um, exoterically, it's of course assumed these are just fact. This happened as described, and people try to imagine what it would mean. Rumi gives us a little bit of insight and helps us to um, enter into the conversation that I would like to have with you tonight. And he says, uh, the, the, the ascension, by the way, is called the mirage, the rising up. And Rumi says, uh, what is the ascension? It is non-being, the return to non-being. And for the lovers, meaning the true lovers, <clears throat> the only religion and the only faith is non-being. In Persian, it's chist miraje falak in nisti, ashekhan ra maz habudin nisti. So we realize already we've entered into unusual territory where love is being described as a disappearance into what we in the West might call the fertile void. And at this level, that this early Muslim mystic. Um, Al-Farabi, Al-Farabias, was talking about um, if we stay at the level of what is imagined and the details of religion, obviously it is hard to see what sort of common heritage these particular three religions might have. Although I'm happy to tell you that there is such a thing and I'm going to be talking about it because it's hard to talk about the fertile void. It's hard to talk about silence and utter darkness. But at that level of oneness, I'm bringing you three or more statements from each of these traditions with which to open the talk. And we have uh, Lao Tzu says, this is from Wen Tzu, they are virtuous 
who close their senses, put away their aspirations and intentions, cast off their intellectual brilliance, and return to a vastness where there is no conscious knowing. From Zhuangzi, the sage said, see nothing, hear nothing, guard your spirit in quietude, and your body will go right of its own accord. Be quiet, be pure, toil not your body, perturb not your vital essence, and you will live forever. Moving to Buddhism, Huineng, the sixth patriarch of Zen, says, all things are not apart from our intrinsic nature. Who would have expected that our intrinsic nature is basically pure? Who would have expected that our intrinsic nature is basically unborn and unperishing? Who would have expected that our intrinsic nature is fundamentally complete in itself. And Rumi says, put cotton in the ear of the mundane senses, pull the sensual blinders off your true eye. Your head's ear is the cotton plugging your real ear. Until the outer ear is deaf, the inner ear stays deaf. Be without sense, without hearing, without thought, to hear the celestial words return to your source. So we can see at this fundamental level, it is plausible to um, make the case for a common heritage of Sufism, Buddhism, and Taoism. At the other level, that which is imaginalized, it's imagined and according to this particular viewpoint, everything we see around us is an imagination, a dream. Obviously not just in the Sufi tradition, but in many traditions. And where there are different imagined realities in the minds of people, in the universal imagination, there of course will be difference and strife. And what I want to do is to speak with you tonight um, about um, the religion that sort of both temporally and in some ways stylistically joins two of the traditions. Buddhism is the central tradition that actually is a link between both Taoism and Sufism. And as you may know, um, the Muslims, their empire spread so rapidly after the death of the Prophet in 632 of the Common Era that within a hundred years there was a new amazing shifting uh, empire that, that spread from Spain all the way to the edges of China. And um, one of the the most important contacts that Muslim civilizations had was with the Buddhist culture in Central Asia that of course was active all the way into um, to the edges of Turkey and of course all the way into China. Um, don't ever plan your talks with PowerPoint. Uh, luckily I, I hadn't and, and I just wanted to show you some images tonight that instead I'll have to describe to you. It's not the engineer's fault. I have an old version of, of um, PowerPoint, apparently. But one of the things that you probably know is on the third floor of this very museum is one of the oldest Buddhist statues. It's from China, from the fourth century. It's an amazing statue. And it shows still the Central Asian influence in the clothing and, and other details. Um, harking back to an earlier period when Buddhist statues were first being made in the Gandhara region. 
And of course, Greek culture was very strong in that area. And so you have um, the Islamic civilization encountering um, Buddhism really uh, more than a thousand years after its inception and several hundred years after it has gone into China. It's very well established throughout India and Central Asia. It has already changed quite a bit. And so now you have bodhisattvas, you have the Mahayana, uh, you have Tantric Buddhism. So you have um, Buddhism is an ocean and it's presumptuous to present these three oceans tonight in one talk and that's why I'm trying to stick with one fish, um, which is the, the Buddha image that um, uh, is so interesting. And it's so interesting because um, these, these individual doctrines that are imaginalized and written about and have scriptures and text just as often keep people from understanding their meaning as helping people to understand. And one of the amazing things about the, the Buddha statues is that they speak volumes if a person is just willing to sit in front of them and look at them. And many Buddhist practices, in fact, are designed to take those Buddhas within, to the imagination within, and to cultivate that image. And when the Muslims arrived in Central Asia, of course you would think they would destroy all of these Buddhas, right? I was just talking um, with Coral, and she was telling me about a friend of hers who a few years ago before the Taliban destroyed the, the Buddhas at Bamiyan, had climbed up high, where I've been myself in 1989, climbed up above the statue, where on the walls of the cavern, you see frescoes. You, you saw, I'm sorry to say, you saw beautiful frescoes. After a thousand years, um, the Taliban had dynamite, huge quantities of dynamite, but anyone over those centuries could have gone up there and scraped off those frescoes and destroyed them easily. Why didn't that happen? 